um, I'll give you control. Okay. I don't mind waiting a few more minutes, but. No, we can go ahead and get started. Okay. You guys can see the screen? Yep. Okay, so this is a patient with uh, adenocarcinoma. I'm trying to stop the loop. Okay, so uh, left upper lobe adenocarcinoma. This is what he looked like in um, October of 2019. Um, and I read his follow-up chest CT about a week and a half ago. Um, and so this is what he looks like uh, a week and a half ago. So here's the adenocarcinoma. Looks pretty much the same, um, but there's all these other um, opacities in the lung. So I checked his uh, adenocarcinoma, his PDL1 expression, and they had started him on, uh, on Keytruda, which is uh, pembrolizumab. Um, and so findings here, uh, just peripheral consolidations, kind of a reverse halo sign, um, a few other consolid peripheral consolidation there. Uh, and then uh, tree and bud nodularity here. So it looks like a, so it looks like a combination of organizing pneumonia and bronchiolitis. So this is a I thought this was a um, drug reaction from Keytruda. Uh, I told talked to the clinician. He thought he thought it, he thought clinically that made sense. So actually there was a uh, very recent October came out October of 2019 radiographics article just on this topic, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors and therapy related pneumonitis. And that's a, I thought it was a pretty good article. They, um, they should go through the, uh, the, the, the way the drug works here. Um, and then they also get into all the uh, immune related adverse events, which include in the lungs, um, pneumonitis patterns, and then they talk about the most common pneumonitis patterns, organizing pneumonia, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and they also mentioned bronchiolitis. So this guy has organizing and bronchiolitis, it seems like. Has um, anyone else ever seen a bronchiolitis pattern? I have not that I recall. <clears throat> no, not that I recall. That's, that is a bit odd, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. I don't think I've seen it, and, and when we do, it's hard to not argue that it's infection, but right, right. So I mentioned infection also possibly, but but I did see that. That's a but it has it been is. described according to that paper you showed. That's exactly six percent. So it's obviously the least uh, common one. Um, and then I was going to show another similar case. Uh, So this this case is, is the same it's the same type of thing, but I found it just looking back uh, 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 through the patient's old. I saw it found it recently, but looking back to the patient's old study, the patient I was reading his old studies. Currently, he's doing well, but so this is what he looked like in 2016. Lungs look pretty clear. He had a right upper lobectomy for his cancer. Lungs look clear, and then. Um, Uh, a few months later, in May of 2017, he developed this little reverse halo in the right lower lobe. And then just, just one or two months later on this PET-CT, uh, so PET-CT is from July, so from May to July, he has these bilateral large consolidations peripherally. He started on this was thought to be a, some kind of fungal infection, started on all kinds of antibiotics, and obviously didn't get better. Uh, so a month later, a month later you got another scan, kept getting worse. Later the same month, even worse. And at this point he was biopsied, 
and this came back organizing pneumonia and they started him on um on steroids and he got a lot better he responded well so same so same basically same thing drug reaction to Keytruda. yeah you know i see a, i think of all the and maybe just because it's used so commonly but i think of all of all these um biologics i have seen more reactions with pembrolizumab than any other one out there mm -hmm. yeah but i you know any of them can do it it's just and i find the organizing pneumonia is by far and away the, the most common mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and interesting i was reading i did not know this um you know they're very hesitant to stop them and so sometimes they'll just taper the dose because the um you, there's something called a flare phenomenon where the tumor can actually grow really fast afterwards yeah. they're responding yeah. So the, yeah, they'll stop them only if the symptoms are uh, pretty pretty severe. Right. So I've seen them get better with some steroids and just a slight dose modulation. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. The great. Yeah, they really mentioned the different how they grade those reactions and how they manage them uh, based on largely based on symptoms. But, uh, that's all I have, guys. Cool. Those are great cases. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Who's up next? I can go anytime. Alrighty. Okay, let me start with this one. So here is the background. This patient was transferred to us from out of state with the history of recurrent pneumothoraces. Apparently sometime in September, he presented with a spontaneous pneumothorax and that was treated in some fashion, perhaps with a tube, but then he had a repeat of the pneumothorax subsequently. So he had two episodes of spontaneous pneumothorax and then was transferred here. So this is obviously at the time of a pneumothorax and I'll show you a couple interesting things. There is a cystic space in the apical right lung through which one can see a vessel traversing. It seems to be one cystic space with a vessel traversing as best I can tell. And he has other cystic spaces. So here's one very close to a pleural surface in the anterior upper lobe. And there were about three to four that I found, I'm trying to remember where, where they were small, in the lungs, elsewhere in the lungs. And if I don't find them right off the bat, I'm just going to skip that because they were small, but there were a couple others that were about a centimeter in size. So initially when they discussed this patient, I just had the history of pneumothorax spontaneous. And at the time I saw the patient, he had already undergone surgery with the usual uh, subpleural bolectomies with a staple gun and a mechanical pleurodesis via VATS on the left side. But then I noticed <clears throat> that his aorta looks like that. So he's 26 years old, 25, 26, with an aorta that looks like that. Then digging some more, I found out that he has a paternal uncle with Marfan's syndrome. And the patient himself is very tall and slim. So knowing the association sometimes between spontaneous pneumothorax and Marfan's, I began to dig a little bit more. So here, if you go to the marfans.org website, you can, among other things, calculate on the basis of the aortic root dilatation, a so-called Z-score. So I did that here. So he's tall, 195 centimeters. He's skinny, 60 kilograms in weight. I put in 3.8 centimeters and got a so-called Z-score of 3.42. And you can see here at the bottom that in the presence of a family history, if you have a Z-score greater than or equal to two, that is sufficient to diagnose a person with Marfan syndrome. So I think based on that, he does have Marfan syndrome. 
And I'm not sure that I have personally seen a case in which one can actually see cysts in the lungs. But with that as background, do you, any of you have any trepidation about associating this with the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome? Not at all. You know, I think you can get cysts with pretty much any disease that affects collagen. I mean, yeah. it makes sense that the, the, out, the, the lung connective tissue just isn't normal. One can certainly find case reports of cystic disease and Marfan. No. Um, I, hadn't, I couldn't find one with an image that looks quite like that on a, on a brief look. Yeah, and they almost, the fact they have internal architecture makes them almost look more like emphysema, but not the classic type we think about. Yeah. So I thought that was a acute case. All right, this is a patient that's interesting too. So initially, somewhat a little surprisingly at the onset of this person's admission early on, uh, he had chest radiographs that were called normal. But if you look at this, you will be able to perceive, I hope, that he does have at least two nodular opacities. And in a moment, you'll see he has more of them in his lungs. So one here and one here, there, maybe down there. So the history that I got initially was that he presented with a set of symptoms and the person that presented him to me um, seemed to be fixated quite a lot on the fact that he had knee pain. He had a knee joint aspirated that showed some not clear looking fluid and that was sent off to culture. Then I noticed that a little bit later on that he did have some imaging of his neck. So I'll show you that in a moment, but I will show you right off the bat that four days after the radiograph, we can see that he has findings very consistent with septic embolism. And he's got pleural fluid. And what is really interesting, and see if you agree with me, is one area in the right middle lobe that is particularly abnormal compared to the other portions of the lung. But in looking at this opacity, unlike down here where it enhances, this is clearly extensive consolidation, but it does not enhance. And I'll show you what that looks like on the lung window. There are even septal lines there. So then I began to look really carefully to see if I could see an abnormal vessel. And not to prolong this too much, but I thought that on multiple images at this level, that there was an artery maybe going in this direction or should go in that direction in the middle lobe that was either narrowed or maybe occluded. But just down here, there seemed to be an absence of a vessel, but I'm not positive about that. Yeah, no, agreed. But it does not look right, right there. It seems to be something is absent. And then this lung looks like a ischemic lung. So I think there is an intravascular abnormality. So then it turns out that he did in fact have symptoms related to his neck. And I will show you that he has what was subsequently drained, which is that full collection right there in the left supraclavicular region. And then I will show you too that in the left brachiocephalic vein is a little clot. So he's got everything that goes along with <clears throat> kind of a Lumiere's syndrome with a source of infection and thrombosis of the vein. And in fact, he did in fact culture, as you'll see here, the bacterium, which is the Fusobacterium necroforum right there by blood culture. And here you can see the ENT consult related to the neck disease. So I initially thought he had septic arthritis and that's still a question exactly what's going on there. But clearly he's got septic embolism. So pretty dramatic case as it turns out of that. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, you wonder if that joint was part of the whole process. 
yeah, that didn't culture from the joint, it cultured from the neck ultimately and the blood. Pretty dramatic. I think that right middle lobe artery is abnormal. I just can't pick out a spot, but I think it's it's really abnormal. And um, that's ischemic lung, I think. Here. Agreed. Um, the next case is Howard. That image right there nicely showed the, the enhancing atelectatic right lower lobe and not so enhancing middle lobe. Yeah. I'll just go through that again. Yeah, yeah, the right difference there. between the two. And there's and maybe really, if you go up a little bit in the right lower lobe, there looked like a low, right there, there's a posterior area. That's, yeah, go to a, a, a just like a more soft tissue window. And yeah, scroll just around there in that area, about right there. See that little, looks like a little abscess. Yeah, that, this may be one of these guys, right? Yeah, like a septic embolus. Yeah, in that location. Right. But this is dramatically abnormal, isn't it? Okay, I've got the third case that's really interesting. It's um, kind of sad how, how this developed. But this person was also transferred from the outside. And I will show you in relation to the chest imaging, but also the, the PET CT in a moment, that she has multifocal disease. So the dominant finding here is the large lesion in the right upper lung. And you'll see it's not a solitary lesion. There's one in the right lower lobe as well. So the dominant one is up there. Let me just in the interest of time show you the PET, which will show you that the person has, I'll just come back down slowly, FDG Abbott lesions. There is the dominant right upper lung lesion. There's also FDG activity related to lymph nodes in the paratracheal mediastinum. And there is also, if I remember correctly, maybe, I thought there was one in the neck, but I'm not sure now. But in addition to that, um, the person also has multifocal osseous disease in the body and also has a liver lesion right there. So we have the simultaneous presentation of pulmonary, nodal, osseous, and liver disease in a relatively young lady. And on biopsy, this turns out to be an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. So this can be isolated to one organ, but if it's an aggressive form, and oftentimes it presents with simultaneous liver, lungs, and bone, which she does have. And it's positive for some Vascular markers, as you can see there. And unfortunately, and this has progressed rather rapidly and severely. So recent imaging has shown substantial progression of the lung disease and the pleural disease. And obviously she's very short of breath, but even the pleural fluid showed some atypical cells. So a case of very aggressive metastatic bad acting epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And that's one of the lesions one should think of in a young person. And I think, I think there's a gender imbalance, if I remember correctly, more females than males present with this disorder. It can be indolent. Most of the cases I've seen, the few that I've seen have been much more indolent over time than this one. All right, Jeff, those are mine. Thanks, Howard. All right, um, David or Travis? I'm happy to go. All right. <clears throat> All right, do you see a CT? Yep. yep. Yeah, so this is, you know, our, our surgeons will show us most things before they end up going to the operating room. They didn't in this case, and it wasn't until this was an outside CT and the subsequent one was as well. And it wasn't until afterwards that I was reading a post-op radiograph and looked back and saw this. But this is a, a woman who was undergoing just routine lung cancer screening. She had a family history of, of lung cancer, was asymptomatic. 
and had this discovered in her anterior mediastinum. And the, the, the attenuation of this is, it was somewhere in the, I think 60 or 70 Hounsfield units. Let's see. Yeah, 55, 60 Hounsfield units. So certainly pretty dense. And you find this curious little thing right here. And so this was thought most likely to be a thymoma. And that's why she went to the operating room. I'll show you the subsequent follow-up CT. And you'll see on the, the next the CT, it also done on the outside. It hasn't changed a year later. It doesn't really distort the mediastinal contours that much, but similar. And, and you know, I saw this before there was any path. I showed this to a couple of people and I thought this was gonna be a, just a, a protonaceous or maybe a hemorrhagic thymic cyst. And I was curious, has anyone ever, ever seen milk of calcium or, or calcium layering out in a thymic cyst? Mm, I don't recall one. I was, yeah, I was wondering, I, I kind of think that's what it was, but long story short, they, they took it out. It was cystic. There's no neoplasm here. And the path actually, though, was a bronchogenic cyst in the anterior mediastinum. So okay. I have not seen an anterior <laughs> mediastinum. Yeah. I haven't seen an anterior mediastinal bronchogenic cyst before. Certainly I've seen them posterior. And again, it's more of an academic point because the idea is this thing is very uniform in its attenuation. There's no enhancement. And then the, there's that. There's probably just a little bit of layering calcium. So. Well, I think it was probably a year or so ago, I showed a case of a thymic cyst that was adjacent to the posterior yeah. aorta. Exactly. So it's for yeah, so it and go where it wants. Yeah, right. It's It's a, right. And we don't, you know, I don't usually try to make a distinction between foregut, you know, either bronchogenic or, or esophageal, but I thought this was kind of interesting to have an anterior mediastinal bronchogenic cyst with a nice, presumably a nice little milk of calcium level in it. Mm, interesting. Yeah. All right, now this one is a pretty interesting case. So this came through, I just saw a follow-up CT on this one this morning. So I'll start with the radiograph here and I'll, I'll pull up the old one for comparison. Yeah, let's stop that. So new one on the screen left that I'm showing you here. And this is a lady who has hemoptysis. This is a, just a comparison radiograph from a year ago. And you can see there's this new veil-like opacity throughout the right hemithorax. And notice that her right hilum is kind of obscured, even her right heart border is a little obscured. And when you look at the lateral view, you know, this looks more like left upper lobe collapse. If you were just looking at the lateral, you know, with this everything being pancaked forward. So this does turn out to be a com combination of right middle and upper lobe collapse, and they're completely unrelated. And it's actually, let me see, which one's the one from? It's this CT. So this CT will show those findings, but it's not the actual collapse that's the interesting thing. Her right upper lobe just looks like she's got some mucus plugging. She's old and frail and probably not clearing secretions. But you can see her right middle lobe, she's got a lot of bronchiectasis and a lot of destruction here. It's just chronic airways infection and some on the left side as well. But check out the size of her bronchial arteries. Yep. You can see how large they are, and just how numerous they are. And there's two things to note from this case, which I, one, I've never seen this before, which is this. There's a macroscopic bronchial artery snaking its way into the right middle lobe bronchus right here. So certainly you would not want to bronch this patient and think that there's something to biopsy in that middle lobe bronchus. And number two, as we've talked about many times in cases of smoke, you can have macroscopic arterial anastomoses between hypertrophy bronchioles in the pulmonary artery. And yeah. here is one such culprit right here. And you can see there's a subtle difference in attenuation. There's actually two bronchial arteries anastomosing with the pulmonary artery right here. And then this one right here. So mm. if you have enough difference in timing between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, you can certainly get a, a smoke phenomenon from inflow of, of blood if it's unopacified, especially in the pulmonary artery. So that prompted me to go back and look, and sure enough, she's had prior CTs, and this was recognized as such, it's just a flow artifact, but here you go, right in that area. This is not a pulmonary embolism, but this is just that unopacified bronchial artery. And even on this study, you can see bronchial artery, but I don't think anybody would actually call that because it looks like it's lower attenuation because there's not much contrast on the left side of the heart yet. 
Yeah, so, black smoke on one occasion and white smoke on another. Yeah. So this is the this this is the the first time I've ever seen a macroscopic bronchial artery in you know jutting into the lumen of a vessel. And also, I think this is the best case of macroscopic bronchial arteries, where you can clearly trace out the communication with the with the pulmonary arteries. That's impressive. So, with a with a massive systemic arterial supply to various portions of the lungs, but also on the left side, are we potentially ascribing this to remote granulomatous infection, for example, with cicatrization atelectasis? I. I, I would imagine I didn't. She's had chronic small airways infection. I don't know if it was old TB. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. I think the other thing to point out too is that remember with bronchiectasis you can also recruit other collaterals as well. And I didn't really take enough time to see where this is coming from. But you can see it's crossing the pleura and drain and communicating with the the right middle and upper lobes. And it looks like this is off the internal mammary artery right here. Yeah. So, yeah, for experienced, ex experienced uh, interventionalists that do a lot of bronchial arteriography, they often have to do other vessels, intercostals, phrenics, subclavian, even. Travis, do you think our underlying disease might be MAC? This would be great for MAC. With those, Probably, I, I think that's definitely. I mean, whatever it is, it's been going on for decades, and I agree. I mean, given the severity in the middle lobe. And the fact that it's completely destroyed, and then the the lingula as well. I didn't actually take the time to look back and see what it was, yeah. in particular. But I can I'll look that up. I, I but I I bet you're right, especially the older uh, older female patient. And the distribution. Yep. Totally agree. Uh, let's see this one, David. Do you have cases to show? I don't want to take up I, too much time. I do. I do. Okay, let me just show one more really quick. So this is a, a patient radiographed two years ago and radiographed now. And you can see, or almost two years apart, his heart looks a little bit bigger and especially the, you know, more the, the base of the heart. And when you look, his retrosternal clear space looks like it's filled in or the RV outflow tract. So you know, not a typical look for what we would expect with a pericardial effusion per se, just it's not that typical water bottle configuration. But he was having worsening uh, symptoms, dyspnea and, and symptoms referable. So he got a PE study, no surprise. And here's what you'll see on the PE study. He has pleural effusions now, and he has not a pericardial effusion, but just circumferential pericardial soft tissue. And this soft tissue kind of intersperses with the epicardial fat. It's surrounding the vessels. So it's a very soft looking tumor. Uh, <clears throat> I think we've seen cases of, of some sort of lymphoma or some sort of myeloproliferative disorder causing this. I've seen a couple of cases of mesothelioma of pericardial origin. He didn't have that history. He did have a history of myelodysplastic syndrome, which led us down the route of thinking this was going to be some sort of malignant involvement from that. And whether he had full-blown AML, I don't really understand some of the genetics of it. But to make a long story short, they, they tapped his pleural effusion, and they actually did a transbronchial biopsy of the subcarinal region. They got some myeloid elements from it, immature myeloid elements. His bone marrow biopsy was negative. And I'll show you what it looks like after his treatment. So this was basically a month later after he's received chemo and radiation. And you can see it's almost completely gone. So this was, I guess, if you want to call it a granulocytic sarcoma or extramedullary you know, myeloid neoplasm of the pericardium, but a pretty dramatic presentation and a, and a near complete response in one month. And I actually wondered if some of the myocardium might be involved as well, but you know, I don't think it matters in, other than academically in this case. So a very diffuse cellular infiltrative process, but yep. of leukemia cells. Wow. Right. Yeah. And I think some of this you can even see is like, like I was trying to point out with some of the fat, you can see it's almost like discrete nodules in the pericardial space as well. And some of it more undulated appearance there, but just you encasing the, the coronaries, but not really causing significant mass effect on them. So it's, it's soft stuff. Yeah. Um, soft tumor. But, um, did you say he got radiation or just chemo? Both. Uh -huh. So, 
Yeah, and they they did radiation to his mediastinum. I don't think there's no his lungs are fine. There's maybe one little node still here, but they're calling this a you know I think calling this a complete response after this. But don't you think he has got nodules everywhere on that on that chest CT? The Let's one see, on, this, on this follow up one. Yeah, I think he's got little yeah. little nodules. And I think, yeah, I agree. This was a PET CT. I hadn't even looked at it on soft tissue windows. But, I wonder, I wonder yeah. if he's got his bloodstream. Um, well, he definitely had pleural involvement based on the, the thoracentesis. And mm -hmm. some of it, yeah, you know, some of that lung is just masked by, I wonder if there's tiny little nodules here. But it was pretty dramatic improvement of his pericardium in a month. So I will stop there it, for now. What about um, the, <coughs> Travis, can you look at the crur on the left side? Is that diaphragm newly elevated? And could he have a phrenic nerve problem? Hmm. Good question. It doesn't really look that thin, does it? Or maybe a little. I don't know. We have no further imaging since this, this um, oh, had CT two months ago. Yeah. Did he have I a guess lot of stuff? Soft... Yeah. I mean, he had, of certainly right there. in this area, and he still had a little bit of residual soft tissue right here where you would expect the phrenic nerve. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a good observation. Good. We'll have to watch and see. Yep, I agree. Okay, so Jeff, I'll stop there. I can circle back with a couple more if there's time. There should be. Okay. All right, David. So this person had um, a fever and had, um, I don't know whether he had a cough or not, but he has these, this outside radiograph here showing some nodules. And a few days later, um, the nodules are more dramatic. He's losing lung volume. He's got some bigger patches. And he had a uh, CT scan around this time. And he has a bunch of nodules and some of them have cavitated like this one down here. And then also he has a, a, a little abnormality in the liver, which was better evaluated on um, this study. And this is, he got sick when he went to Wisconsin. So this is a Wisconsin case. I'm gonna, he got sick when he was on a trip to Wisconsin. So I don't know, Jeff, this is a slam dunk blastomycosis. N not typical. I mean, just <laughs> okay. Well, it turns out when they talked to him, they they uh, biopsied this. Um, they stuck a needle into this liver abscess, and they cultured Klebsiella. He also had Klebsiella in his sputum, and it turned out that two weeks before he got sick, he'd had a uh, a banding procedure for internal hemorrhoids, and um, so this is uh, Klebsiella with septic emboli with liver abscess and septic emboli and it was thought that the uh, portal of entry was his um, hemorrhoidal banding procedure so um, you know you'd think it's bad enough to having hemorrhoids but then if you have your hemorrhoids treated and you get klebsiella you know that that's that's just doubly bad it's so unfair okay so klebsiella with septic emboli liver abscess and septic emboli Okay, so it had nothing to do with Wisconsin. It was just incidental. So Jeff, you can you can breathe easy. All right. <laughs> okay, and then this person has um, had Borhovs. This person was transferred down from Alaska. Uh, had Borhovs and um, you know got an esophageal stent, and they tried at the Alaska institution. They tried to remove the stent after a while, and they were unable to do it. So the person got transferred to our institution here to try harder to remove the stent. So at this point, the person has had a second second procedure and they've actually got a stent within a stent. So that's why the mesh looks more intense up here because there's actually a second stent. It looks more intense down here too. So maybe it's just blurring from uh, cart, cart motion. But the person has this persistent consolidation in the left face. So let's back up a few days and here's the here's the outside imaging. You see at this point, the, the top of the stent was lower. So I think we're, that 
first radiograph I showed you was after they'd put the stent within the stent. And there was quite a bit of consolidation in the left lung base and pleural effusion. And the uh, question is, why is there consolidation in the left lung base? Well, it's probably uh, de Boerhaave's partly, and there are, there's some gas that's ectopic down here. So I think this is gas that's getting in, maybe into the pleural space down here. I think it's pleural. Um, and there were a couple of places where I thought I could connect this gas actually with some bronchi in the lungs. So I was just wondering even whether there was a fistula and there's pleural effusion. But look at the effect of, the, of this stent on this left bronchus. So part of his lower lobe issues are, I think, this extrinsic compression of his bronchus. So his, that subsequent radiograph that I started with showed some clearing of the left lower lobe stuff, but persistent atelectasis down there. The pleural effusion component is much better, but he still has this uh, consolidation of the left lower lobe. So I've not seen this before where a esophageal stent has an effect on the adjacent bronchus, but seems to be operating in him. So yeah, he doesn't seem to have a lot of room in there. That's right. His he got a narrow AP diameter. His spine is his L spine is a thoracic spine is a little bit deep, and um, you know there's not a lot of space. And then you kind of wonder: Are these bronchi maybe a little bit flaccid because the caliber of this bronchus is? is um, I guess, I guess it's decent, but I, I just wonder if he's got some flaccidity of his bronchi. So uh, stent contributing to lower lobe. So they when they uh, they did bronchoscopy and. They tried to remove the stent um, and they found that there had actually been tissue growth into the stent and it was not going to come out easily. So at that point, they put a stent within it. They were able to get the bronchoscope past that um, narrowed area. So it's not as if it's a fixed stenosis, but it seems to me that in the resting position, that bronchus is uh, obstructed. Okay, so stent uh, versus bronchus, stent winning. And then this is a case of a woman who's had a long history. At this point, she had a pneumothorax on the right. She'd already had pneumothorax on the left. She has this chronic blending of the left cuspering angle from solid pleural thickening. She's got a staple line up here. And it turns out there's an underlying abnormality. So let me bring you up to date with uh, more current imaging. This is several years later now. And you can see that her lungs look kind of ragged. She's got that chronic pleural thickening down here. And on CT, uh, you'll see that she's got a lot of lung cysts. So cysts all over the place. At this point, she, I think she had uh, probably had a pneumothorax in that fissure. And um, and then we get down into the abdomen, and she's got these luscious angiomyelipomas. Now, her even more ancient history, 10 years ago, was that she required embolization uh, of a bleed in one of these kidneys. I'm not sure which it was, but she has had embolization. And then if we go back up into her chest and get into her heart, we see that she's got some low attenuation things floating around in her myocardium. And uh, here's one. She had some in the liver too. I don't know if you mentioned that or not. I wasn't right. I was, listening yeah, I was to completely to that. Right. So actually I've got abdominal imaging here, which um, I think shows the liver lesions better for sure, but she's got MFFs, or, or she's got fatty, fatty foci in her liver, and then we get back into the into the chest here, and she's you've got some inner septum here and elsewhere. They're scattered around. They're not that many, but there are definitely some of these MFFs in the um, in the heart. So. This is the first time I've seen those things. This person has documented tuberous sclerosis. She doesn't have any neurologic manifestations. I think her uh, I think her brain imaging has been okay. But this is uh -huh. tuberous sclerosis. David, and does she have sclerotic bone lesions too? Can we look at her spine? Because that would be another marker of, of TS versus just spontaneous well, lamb. Let's, uh, let's check it out here. Oftentimes in the pedicles or posterior elements. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isolated one. Oh, the more you look, you wonder, don't you? Yeah. I think if you windowed it a little bit more, you'd see some in the pedicles down lower or okay. the post elements process, there. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. 
down yeah. here. Okay, so tuber sclerosis. Um, and then the other thing, which is entirely uh, not clinically significant, but it shows the appearance of talc slurry within an interlobar fissure. So yeah. um, that's just a curiosity. If you look at the left major fissure, you'll see the on the lung window. Why is the line here? And then module here, right. right there, right there, yeah. And then, then posteriorly, there was some bright stuff back here. Yep, there was a talc slurry in other places. Right. Wow, interesting. Okay, those are uh, those are my three. All right. Um, Thank you. Let's see here. Okay, let's start with um, this case. And unfortunately, I don't have a chest radiograph because they didn't send us one. But let's see if it loads. So this is a 23-year-old who works in the forest industry, who presented with a 20 uh, two-week history of cough, fever, and received three different antibiotics and never got better. And uh, <clears throat> since David disappointed me with the Wisconsin case, I do have one here. So uh, you can imagine her radiograph showed this big, ugly area of consolidation. But what I want to show, this is the uh, a CT here that he did on the outside that shows there's necrosis, cavitation. You can see the low attenuation areas, quite dense. Uh, low bar consolidation there, and then some involvement of the lower lobe. And I want to point out conspicuous absence of pleural fusion and really not too much in the way of lymph node enlargement. I mean, maybe you can't really see the hilar nodes, but, you know, what I'd call reactive. They don't look really angry that we'd see. Um, this is, a, 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 these are the lung windows just showing you the um, involvement here. And you can see there's this dense, dense consolidation, and then sort of these smaller nodules spiculated things around it and this this is a pretty typical appearance when we see this especially with that history um you know, her exposure is in a hot spot for blasto so this is no proven blastomycosis by bal which saw the yeast as well as a positive urinary antigen um jeff do you think there was chest wall involvement did she have chest pain with this do you he think did not going? and i i looked at it um i did not see any let me um it's up against the chest wall, but there was no osteolysis. It doesn't typically, in my experience, extend into the chest wall like Acteno does. It can involve bone um, and chest walls and soft tissue um, in the you know, muscle fat, but I've not seen it cross into the chest wall directly like this that I recall. So but this is a case of blastomycosis, but... Um, you know, even though it's January here, it can it can hang around for a while. It can take a couple of months to declare itself. So, um, most likely, she picked it up in the fall before things started to get to get a little bit frozen. Um, this is a cool case uh, my colleague Chris Francois shared with me. So, this is a guy, and this is a good case for a couple of reasons. Um, this is a guy who um, has a remote history of a motor vehicle crash, and this is his more recent radiograph, and clearly there's a diaphragmatic contour abnormality. Uh, but there's also this little nodule here that you can see. And so I'm going to show you a recent chest CT to show a couple of things. I'll show the diaphragmatic hernia, which, interesting, I don't know why has never been repaired. It must not have any, he must not have any symptoms. It's so big, um, I guess they decided not to repair or he just didn't want it repaired. But you can see the, the cruise is thinned out. A little bit there. It's not, it's not um, fully atrophy, but it's a little. The diaphragm itself is a little bit thin. But then I wanted to point out um, that you see a couple of nodules in his upper abdomen. You'll notice his spleen is not there. And then if we look carefully, uh, we can see these little soft tissue nodules in the chest wall. And um, there's a few along the pleural. There's one right there along the pleural surface. There's another one there. And so one of these was we were seeing on the chest radiograph. You can sometimes see them a little bit better on the lung windows, these little pleural nodules. Mm. Here and a couple right right down here is one as well. Now I found an old abdomen CT that had uh, actually an old that had contrast, and we can see that these do enhance during arterial phase uh, pretty brightly. And you can see the chest wall ones quite nicely here. So this is a nice traumatic diaphragmatic hernia with a uh, plural, but also chest wall splenosis. And I think I, I, I remember showing a case of this a few years ago. 
because I'd not seen it in the chest wall before, but apparently splenic tissue, wherever it can land, it'll grow. See? Yeah. If I do a coronal here, you can see the um, <clears throat> diaphragmatic defect. Sorry, as soon as it loads here. There we go. It's quite a sizable defect. You, know, you see there, there's the diaphragm, and then there's the big, big hole in it right there. So it just sort of tore apart. There's really no lateral attachment, so it would be pretty hard right. to attach that at all. So there's the risk of anything getting strangulated is pretty low. Probably the surgical risk is greater. But. Okay, um, this was a case I came across the other day. Um, this was a B read. Uh, I know nothing about the patient, um, but I thought it was cool because it has – uh, you can see the patient's had heart surgery, and it's a 50-something-year-old patient, um, presumably just otherwise healthy occupational screen. But you'll notice the ribs here are notched. Right. You know, looking to see if there's a clip there. I mean, typically for a co arct repair, um, you wouldn't do a sternotomy because you wouldn't be able to reach there. So I wonder if she had, and I don't see a valve prosthesis. I have no nothing. I don't see any uh, cabbage wires. So presumably... She had, I'm guessing she had coarctation and maybe um, an atrial septal defect or ESD or something that was closed. These are not baby wires, so presumably these were closed during like adolescence or child or adulthood. But Or maybe she had aortic stenosis. Uh, you know, 50% of the course will have aortic stenosis. Right. But I don't see a valve. That was the only thing I was looking for was there was an aortic valve. Right. And are you just attributing all that left paravertebral paraspinal stuff to tortuous descending aorta? Because there's a lot of yeah, I agree. There's this here interfaces in there. here. I, unless there's some collateral. <laughs> I mean, again, I have nothing else to go on with this. Yeah. So it's but I'm showing it because it's just it's we don't see rib notching anymore, and this one was just quite striking. So it was kind Ooh. of. Fun. I'll see if I can try to find information, but I seriously doubt it. All right, and then uh, Chris Francois also um, shared this case with me. This is a this is a cool case. So this is a no, oh, I forgot to hold already. I just wrote it down. Uh, anyway, a patient who has um, um, chronic has pulmonary hypertension. You can see on the PA radiograph, and this thing here is actually just a Bach electronia. The this enlarged interlobar pulmonary area. The main pulmonary segment's large, but you'll notice the lower lobe pulmonary area is rather small, and mm. it's a little bit hyperlucent in here. I'll show a coronal now. Um, and with the coronal, we can see as well that the left lower lobe is hyperlucent, and the vessels are rather small, and you don't really see much in the way of that descending pulmonary artery. Now, if we look at the axial contrast images, we'll see um, that this patient change the window here there we go that this patient has an eccentric filling defect going to the left lower lobe pulmonary artery and very little flow beyond it uh, not so much smoke there but you can see the bronchial arteries not that this is not as nearly as good as travis's case but you can see the bronchial arteries heading down that way um, so some chronic pe and there's a little narrowing at some other areas there as well and there's a web here and then you see the dilated RV. It's not that thick. Um, but this this patient's going to be referred for endarterectomy because they would be a good candidate. Nice central thrombus here. But it's kind of neat because you can see the, the perfusion defect on the radiograph. And if we look at the, the lung windows here, you can see the decreased attenuation. Now, there's some airway stuff going on here confounding it. But um, I think a nice example of, of chronic pain. Yeah with the hypertrophied bronchial arteries. And um, and I think another important finding is look at the side in the other areas, you, you get really big vessels. And that I find that when you don't have expiratory images in addition to the just the airways, because this one you could, is a little confounding because you do have some bronchial disease. But when the pulmonary arteries get this big, that's almost always um, a vascular cause of the mosaic attenuation. And then they're all. There may have been some intercostal arteries trying to feed the left lower load, maybe. As yeah, you, scroll, right. you get the little bit of rattiness there. Sometimes you can see those. Yeah, from the on the mediastinal window, there were a couple. Yep, they're pretty big. Um, and you do wonder whether some of them are actually trying to get in through the pleura a little bit. Maybe so. Yeah, it looks so like I mean, there must be good good flow down there. But, um, I mean, this is a 
fairly early phase scan. I and mean, there's a little bit of smoke there, but not a lot, given the degree of bronchial arterial perfusion down there. So kind of a nice case of CTEF with a, a big central clot. So, so an endarterectomy should improve that. Now the, the rest of the lungs, it's just that little web on the right, and there's there's a couple, there's a little missing a few areas, but uh, they'll evaluate them for uh, the patient. For that. All right, and then uh, quickly, uh, this is just a cool case because we don't see these very often. Uh, this is a patient um, who developed endocarditis, and this has got to be one of the largest vegetations I've ever seen oh. on a CT. You can see there's a there's a there's a prosthesis in there, and so it's just hanging out on the prosthesis. And then just to show you how big it is, this is the echocardiogram, and you can see the just the huge thing just sitting right on it. So this is a this is a one that's this is this is going to be a redo of a redo. It's a younger patient um, had a had this came infected. Then this was a spontaneous infection. Um, had a remote history of drug use, but nothing recently after the first incident. It just became, but it's quite just a large, ugly vegetation there. All right, Travis, did you want to show a few more? Sure. Go through two more. All right, this is one I just saw. This is kind of interesting, 42-year-old who, until two years ago, was asymptomatic and for whatever reason <laughs> underwent a radiograph and then had this abnormality. This is not a history of trauma in this case, but we can see the finding is this abnormality at the right anterior hemidiaphragm. We see there's a lot of loops of bowel and, and a air fluid level in this area, so certainly bowel, and the question is going to be, is it even traded? or is it a Morgagni hernia? And I guess one question for you guys, do you have any tips or tricks for distinguishing the two? Because I don't know, you know, it's it's awfully focal and it looks like it's kind of narrow necked and I guess that would be the only thing I would think would say, yes, this is a more, uh, some sort of hernia, like a Morgagni hernia rather than eventration. Or if you see this, are you gonna prompt them to get a CT? Any, uh... Well, it's very it's very confined anteriorly there, and it's got a lot of bowel in it. So, uh, overwhelmingly, I think this favors more gagne over yeah. anterior eventration. And are are you saying that because you think if it were eventrated, it would be more likely to be liver? It would be without a, bowel in it. It would be a gentler contour, and it yeah. and and uh, eventrations usually don't have gut in them unless the uh, liver is dropped back. You know, there's it's kind of chylodidi. Uh, yeah, colonic interposition. Yeah, well, right. So this this did end up being a, a large Morgagni type hernia, and you can see there's the typical finding we look for is just the uh, omental vessels going through there. There's colon, there's small bowel in there. This was actually just reduced in the operating room this morning. That's how I saw a post a post op radiograph. But I guess my question was, yeah, just you know, how how confident can you be one way or the other? And I think for the findings that you said, David, yeah. probably. You, know, you can be reasonably confident this is going to be a hernia, but this was picked up a couple of years ago, and apparently he was asymptomatic before that, but then it's one of those ones where I think they told him he had something, and then all of a sudden he started noticing that he was having weird postprandial pain. And, yeah. The, yeah. The coronal should be really nice. Could you give us a coronal? That, sure. That what shows you the vessels fanning out above the Right deep. there. Yeah, that's perfect. You've got, you've got that little waist right there. Yeah, and the same thing on the on the sagittal right in here. So, yeah, so that's a quick one. And then this is, this is another relatively quick one. And this is one, we see this at least two or three times a year, I think. And I think this is important, you know, especially for the residents to remember. And this is one that, you know, we can make the diagnosis from across the room. And I know Jeff and I've talked about this at the, when we're in Reston. This is a lady who was referred to us for interstitial lung disease and Really, when you see that the the radiogram or the scalp, I guess I didn't keep the scalp from the subsequent CT, but this was in July of this year. When you see this radiograph, there's a little bit of volume loss here. It certainly, maybe could be a low bar pneumonia, but you want to know how sick she is. And it turns out she's got 
just kind of gradually worsening dyspnea. Here's the CT that she had at the time. And this was actually called honeycombing in this area and traction bronchiectasis. And there, sure, maybe there's a little bit of reticulation elsewhere, and she might have a little bit of interstitial lung disease, but I think you guys all know where I'm going with this. Yeah. That, you know, this is, we see this two or three times a year now where it's a slam dunk adenocarcinoma, and it's called or referred to us for workup of interstitial lung disease. And I can see where people get confused because they see, they see some underlying architectural distortion, but you know, it should just never be this focal. And of course, the patient has symptoms that are more subacute to chronic. And you know, this was a month later, and you can see they were doing exp inspiratory and expiratory and even prone imaging at that time. Uh, some of these images showed that there may be, like here, I, I bet this is gonna be, I bet this is all adenocarcinoma involving both lungs. But anyway, I saw this and just told them this is almost 100% adenocarcinoma. They actually went back to their outside hospital and I don't know how they did a biopsy, either transbronchial or maybe CT guided, but they did confirm that there was that there was invasive adenocarcinoma. But there is this lung, this, so. there's also peripheral reticulation on both sides that doesn't really I, look like So I totally agree. Yeah, I no, there, there's, there's please and lice. So sorry, what'd you say, David? Please and lice. I think this person has two conditions here. I think there is um ILD as well. Oh, I agree. I, yeah, I, and that's I said, yeah, I think that there is some separate, there is some mild reticulation. She's in her 70s. So it yeah. could be an early, you know, she's developing an early interstitial lung disease probably. But then you look at these, this is probably areas of adenocarcinoma in the left lower lobe. This certainly is. And then she's got some areas in her right upper lobe. So sh certainly she has some a more pressing issue at this point in time. Right. But yeah. yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's just that we see it. And I'm sure you do too, where you see patients referred in for quote unquote ILD that end up having adenocarcinoma because it can be tricky, especially you know when it starts to distort lung and, and cause what looks like fibrosis. It's but yeah, I agree. I think there is a secondary process. So a lot of these patients are initially treated for pneumonia and they get better. They, they feel better, but they don't get follow-up <laughs> radiographs to show that the radiographic abnormality didn't go away, that it's slowly right. Or, or certainly adenocarcinoma can decrease, you know, on subsequent radiographs, but not completely resolve. And that may be that they did have a superimposed pneumonia, or as it becomes, as the lung remodels from an invasive adenocarcinoma just shrinks. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah, they feel better because their azithromycin gives them an anti-inflammatory response. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks.